Welcome to We Are Everyone, a video and podcast series powered by Pivotal Moments, and we focus on the intersection of mental wellness in the workforce. We bring together young professionals and mindful executive mentors to bridge the generational gap and bring to the surface conversations about the importance of mental wellness and how to overcome career tradition challenges. Mental wellness is paramount. Join us. Welcome to Mental Recess. I am your host, Jen Sherman, and we have a very special guest today. We have Katie, or I guess we could also say Dr. Katie, uh, Cross the Poly. She is the Director of Healthcare Education at Edcetra. Um, and I guess, you know, I always love to have the guests, our guests, kind of introduce themselves, give us a little a bit about your background and how you discovered your passion. Well, I will also I will also uh, kind of tee up that we'll be talking about um, the veterinary field and mental health today and education, just as a little teaser. But Katie, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama originally, and I'm one of those kids that kind of grew up loving animals. And as an introvert, I tended to just spend a lot of my time with my pets growing up. And so I knew really early on I wanted to be a vet. And um, around 16 years old, I started working in clinics and getting a taste of the field and decided that's what I wanted to do. So um, I went to Auburn University and I worked as a student worker some um, when I was there while I was getting through vet school. And then I did small animal practice for about nine years before trying poultry for a year, which was super fun and um, definitely not something I ever expected to be doing. But um, unfortunately, I developed some allergies to cats and horses and needed to shift to something different. And uh, fate just kind of worked in my benefit and connected me with et cetera, with this position, which started out as a veterinary education director position. And I um, got to step into vet prep and vet tech prep, which are some existing products that help students learn and get ready to pass their licensing exams. And um, after that, we ended up actually launching Vetcetera, which is a continuing education provider and community for veterinarians, technicians, all veterinary health professionals, really. Um, and we also are trying to build out some of those community features, including supporting health and wellness in both the physical and mental aspects. Awesome. Well, I mean, not to be like, I guess in the regards of developing an allergy later on, I guess that was a creative pivot that you had to make um, in, in that regard. How, how was that kind of in that transition? Oh, that was really difficult for me, actually. Um, I probably waited later than I should to make the change. And um, I think part of that was that I just had this mental picture about what my life was supposed to be. And I had these goals. I'm a super goal oriented person. So you know, I, I just had this plan for my life and how it was supposed to look. And um, when it got time to kind of admit that things weren't working well <laughs> with how my plan was supposed to be, I had a bit of an identity crisis. Um, you know, my sort of my self-worth and, and vision was in being a clinician and treating pets and interacting with clients. And so having to let go of that and switch to something completely unknown to me was very scary. And I, I did have some trouble with it, but it ended up being a great thing. It just, it was a hard change to make at the time and definitely not something I anticipated. Um, I actually was allergic to animals when I was really little, like toddler, I was, I was allergic to them and I'd grown out of it. So I thought I was in the clear and I started noticing some symptoms coming back my last year of vet school and um, tried my best to manage it. But, you know, it just, it was just not something I ever even had pictured being a possibility when I was learning and planning to go to vet school. It, it was even on my radar that they would come back at some point. And so it was just a major life change. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, we talk a ton. I know I kind of hopped around here with our questions, but I thought, you know, talking about that transition, we talk about transitions a lot at Pivotal Moments Media because I think life as I, I am definitely a goal-oriented person as well, Katie. Uh, it's like, I've always looked looking ahead, like, okay, five years. And it's like living in the present can be difficult at times, um, but I'm working on it. But anyways, I just think that, you know, especially school and the investment and all that stuff. It's just a matter of, you know, really knowing though, or is, you know, I believe in the universe is putting us on this path. So it's kind of like what then, you know, you went through all this education. How can you apply this perhaps in a different type of way than the norm, than the way that you initially planned? Um, so yeah, no, th and thank you for sharing. And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more about, um, 
details around that further along the interview, but I'm kind of curious, um, cause this kind of leads up to just where you are now and all of that, but like, you know, as you were pursuing your career, what challenges did you come across either personally or with practitioners that people don't necessarily consider when thinking about working in that field? Oh, I would, there were a lot of challenges I wasn't really prepared for, which I just, you know, and I don't know how you prepare someone. That's something I've pondered for a long time is like, how, how do we adequately prepare students for all the things that they're going to face? And I think it's just really hard because when you're in school, you're, you know, most of us are type A perfectionist, goal oriented people. We're introverted, usually not always. I mean, there are certainly exceptions, but just as a general rule. And so um, I think that it's just hard to, um, step out of that and see what the other things might be that might come into play. So um, for, for example, like I worked in clinics since I was 16. So I thought I knew what that was like, right. As a working as an assistant and um, you know, a kennel health person. Um, but it changed completely when you're the person making the decisions and all of the pressure is on you as, as opposed to a veterinarian that you're working under. Um, I think the pressures were definitely more than I anticipated in terms of feeling the need to be perfect, not, you know, not having space to really learn and make normal human mistakes. And um, it was, it was really hard to not beat myself up if I felt like things didn't go as planned or I could have done something better. Um, So I think that I underestimated what, what that would be as far as an impact in the profession. Um, I also definitely underestimated uh, the impact of sort of the the way the business is set up. Obviously, the veterinary clinic does run it as a business, and it's not like the human health care field where there is insurance in place that automatically pays the, the clinic or the hospital. And I definitely underestimated what those financial pressures would do both to me as a veterinarian and to pet owners and how they would respond to those financial pressures to us. Um, and that, you know, that comes in terms of um, owners lashing out, blaming the veterinarian for being in it for the money, um, you know, just getting really upset and, and rightly so. But the, the interplay of that between veterinarian and owner was really hard to come to terms with and to, to get comfortable with. Um, and certainly as vets, we want to we get into this to help animals. We want to help all of them. But you also realize at some point that you literally can't, <laughs> you know, we can't we can't pay for all the treatments that everyone can't afford. We can't adopt the animals that can't get what they need, um, you know, as a, as a single singular person, that's not something that we can do and have it be sustainable. So learning to, um, you know, create those boundaries and to understand that when someone is upset, um, either about finances or an outcome that is not what they wanted, that you have to not take that personally. Um, those are, those are the types of, of challenges that I had a hard time with, um, and definitely underestimated the impact they would have on me on a daily basis. Yeah. And also I'm sure, and I don't know this because I did not go to veterinary school. I do know that it's very hard to get into. So congratulations on that. Yeah. Um, you know, as a business owner, to, as a business owner, they don't teach you some of like the skills, right? I mean, and I didn't even go to business school, but I'm, but I'm assuming that in veterinary, veterinarian school, they didn't teach, there was, they didn't teach you the mental health aspect of it, right? It's more of like the practical applications, Right. Yeah. Which I think is getting a little bit better. It's been a slow change, but definitely when I was in school, um, you know, it was much more focused on the medical aspect. So the science, the, the, the practical daily medical aspect. So we did not have um, much business management. We definitely didn't have, you know, communication skills or stress management, um, how to prepare for burnout. Those types of things were not really addressed. Um, We do see some movement there in that, universities are starting to provide some counseling support, maybe some classes on that type of stuff. Um, There are typically clubs that will have um, business management skills, but it is definitely something that's not super heavy in the curriculum as a standard. So you still might have to seek it out a little bit on your own, which is hard to do in vet school when you're crazy busy and stressed. Of of course. I mean, it's like, it's kind of those things where, you know, mental health is one thing you also focus on where it's like, that's when you have a little more bandwidth to then look at like, oh, wait, I am not in a good space right now. Um, so curious, cause I kind of, you know, noodling around here and it just sounds to me like your path now that I've heard about your path and transitions, like it makes so much sense to me of what your mission and purpose is, because it's like, you've, you are that example who've gone, who's gone through you, you know, you're, you've gone through 
being, you know, or practicing, because you're always a veterinarian, practicing as a veterinarian, then facing personal challenges that you had to address that also affected your mental health. And then now being able to apply that to that field. I mean, that's really awesome um, and unique in that regard, because you can kind of see it from all sides. And, and I don't think sometimes, you know, we did go when we went through the pandemic, you know, really thinking about doctors, healthcare and stuff, but at the end of the day, particularly as a, as a, um, as a physician or someone who's caring for another person, another person or dogs or cats or horses life and well being, like you kind of sometimes have to put your own mental health aside and care for them. So it's interesting to kind of, um, go through that experience than being able to apply it. So I'm kind of curious, like, uh, how, you talked about, you, you mentioned, you know, the challenges you mentioned, um, you know, in the beginning of the interview, that transition, but I'm kind of curious of how you've been able to apply all of that, um, to inform your role now, and then also kind of dive a little bit more into your current role with, um, et cetera and et cetera. Yeah. Um, so this is, this position has definitely opened a lot of doors. You know, I do feel like like you said, I kind of lived the process of being one thing, having to get through that period of my life where I wasn't comfortable making a change. I was scared. I, I, um, you know, had to kind of grieve what I thought my life was going to be going to be, and then look forward to the future and what it could be and have a positive attitude about that. So, um, like you said, living, living that experience has, um, opened my eyes to some of the challenges that other people are facing. And I, I do feel like it's, you know, they're, they're, everybody in the veterinary profession right now is crazy busy slam. Nobody has enough time to think about what their needs, their mental health. Um, and there, there are a lot of people who are looking for a way out. And I think that, you know, for some people, that's the right choice. If you are really, really burnt out, it, it may be time to pivot for, like you said, for a minute and, and do something different and kind of get back to a healthy space. And then, um, you know, there's always a possibility of going back to clinical practice after that when you're in a better place. And so I, I think that et cetera, specifically, um, even though we just launched it pretty recently, we launched in October. Um, I have big dreams for the types of things that we can offer there as far as connecting people with resources, connecting people with information, um, hosting conversations. I think a big part of this, um, as far as a way to help the veterinary profession as a whole, is to actually have those conversations on a public platform with people who are willing to talk about their struggles and the things that help them personally. Because as, as a community that tends to be kind of introverted and, and is generally very stressed, um, you know, some people either don't have the time or just are not in a place to reach out themselves and try to, try to find those answers. So having those conversations in a public manner where people can see, oh, hey, you know, somebody else went through this, this is what they did. These are some resources I could try and seeing that it can turn out. Okay. I think is a helpful thing in general, just to share those stories and experiences to encourage other people who are in a similar struggle that it will be okay. And they can get through it. So I, I, I see that cetera having a big role in that and et cetera in general has that, that sort of mission of supporting whatever profession we're in all the way through, you know, not just the clinical or practical aspects, but the bigger picture of the profession and the struggles that they might face. Yeah. But I, yeah. And, and I love that. It's kind of, but I have a question kind of for you it, within that, because you, you mentioned when you were in school, right. And when you're in school and you're not necessarily thinking about like m your mental health, like you're just kind of going through it, like goal oriented, totally understand that you're just going through the motions of what we need to go through in order to accomplish what we need to accomplish. But from a connect connection standpoint. So I'm thinking of myself where I'm a advocate for my own mental health, where I'm like very in tune with my feelings, bodies, all that, like all those things, anxieties. And I will go and seek those types of resources. I will say, I don't, I have blue cross blue shield. I know that they have a bunch of resources, but I haven't really like dug in, like I haven't explored them. And, and frankly, sorry, blue cross blue shield. Like I would love to see more personalized healthcare of like you kind of knowing what I, and then being able to send me like resources. So from an education communication standpoint of like connect being that connecting point, you know, what kind of strategies or tactics or initiatives have you at least seen want to implement to really reach these doctors? So one of the big things for me, you know, there are some things that we're just not going to be able to do. Obviously we're right. not an insurance 
company. Right. We're not going to be able of to actually physically um, counsel someone or provide that therapy, but um, providing opportunities for peer re, re, uh, peer-to-peer support. So like connecting people with the AVMA resources that are available that they may not know about or not one more vet or pride VMC, some of these big organizations who are nonprofits that are run by veterinary professionals for veterinary professionals are a lot of times the best source of support and information for us because it is, like you said, so hard to get, you know, um, truth therapy. Uh, you know, certainly it's very valuable and it's great if you can get it. But a lot of times what we find is that somebody, you know, t- it takes time to find the right therapist. It takes time to find, find that resource that works for you that is in that type of true therapy field. But um, peer-to-peer support and having someone you can go to and talk to or somewhere you can go for, you know, perhaps a grant or something if you're struggling financially, like not one more vet provides. Having those sorts of things does increase the chances of somebody feeling like they have the space to really take their time and try to find what works for them for support. Yeah, no, and totally. I didn't mean to put on the aspect of that you are a provider by any means. I'm just thinking about how I, if I'm going to look for any resources or education, like kind of where do I go um, aspect and how to kind of connect the docs. So we're like, it's such an information overload environment. Uh, and so it's kind of being able to be, be guided to the right resource to particularly with how fast we're moving. It's kind of like, if you don't have the time to do all the resource research, you know, what are those, what are those places that can provide that for you? Um, so kind of diving in a little bit into, you know, more into your like advocacy around mental health, you know, what has the state of the conversation um, on this topic been like within the industry? So there's been a lot of conversation within the industry in general. Um, you know, most, most of the big corporations, the pharmaceutical companies are having the conversations at this point that there is a problem. Um, you know, we, we recognize that everyone is stressed, overworked, you know, time constrained generally, um, the conversations tend to be more along the lines of what a individual veterinarian can do for getting support, which obviously is important. You know, vet techs, veterinarians, we, we do have a personal responsibility for, you know, setting boundaries, finding our resources, doing what we need to take care of ourselves. Um, I do think that it's important to also talk about what employers can do as support. Um, you know, there is some stigma still in the profession with mental health. I I think that it's gotten better, but it's definitely still there um, that not everyone feels like they can bring up their their struggles and maybe that they need some extra time to heal from a mental health challenge with their employer and feel safe about that. Um, So I think that's an area that needs more work. Um, We do need to get rid of that stigma that's still sticking around. Um, But it's good that the conversations are happening. You know, 10 years ago, the conversations weren't happening at all. People, it was already a problem, but it was really just kind of being swept under the, under the rug, you know, tough it, tough it out. We went through it. You're fine. Um, this is just the job you signed up for. So I do think it's a good thing that the conversations have shifted to some degree to acknowledging that there's a problem and providing some, some resources, but we still have a lot to do in that, in that aspect. Well, I guess the first step is awareness, right? So like awareness right. and being able to recognize that. Cause I think pre pandemic, particularly like there's always been, people have always had these types of feelings, like feeling stress, like running a million miles per hour, probably pressures are a little bit on now, just the state of the environment. But I mean, if you look at history, there's been obviously like a lot of things that are happening that are out of our control. But I think just now the pandemic has allowed us to address the underlying, um, issues at hand um, and challenges. And I think this goes across, you know, a lot of different industries where, you know, having that basic understanding that, listen, we know that you're slammed and there's not much we can do about that, right? But how can we have an open dialogue about it? How can we create boundaries, you know, with your time, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, how can you really find that time for yourself? Um, so you are able to show up for yourself and then also, you know, for at, at, um, when you're practicing as well. So you're not burned out because that's dangerous to yourself and others. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's where we run into trouble. Um, you know, most of us are 
like I mentioned before, type A introverts, perfectionists. We also, a lot of times are empaths. And so, you know, when we see that pet owner and that pet that are in trouble and it's the end of the day and we're already slammed and it's already going to be two hours that later that we're going to get out of work. Um, you know, when we see that, it's like, it's a, it's kind of a lose-lose situation for us where if you draw the boundary, yeah, you have time for yourself, but then you take on the guilt and grief and, you know, all of those feelings associated with not being able to help the pet. And then if you help the pet and you stay, you don't have time for yourself and you burn out. So it's kind, it's kind of a, a catch 22 for us. And so it's, um, it's something that we have to get comfortable with. There's just that, that being uncomfortable and recognizing that even though it sucks and it really, it just does, it sucks. Um, the profession can't survive if we do continue to just burn ourselves out by doing more and more and more. And, you know, yes, it is horrible when a pet can't get help, but if we can't sustain ourselves in the profession in the long run, we're doing more harm. So, um, that, that's definitely a, a thing that I think, um, is a problem. Yeah. And I think the scale of healthcare is much smaller for the vet for, 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 you know, animals. So it's not like we're at a huge hospital where there's, you know, the, like they're around the, the clock, like every, like, it's really, if you have a smaller practice, it could be you and one other person. So it's not, that it's like we're operating at a large scale hospital for these pets too. So that's even more pressure on the doctors. Well, we do have some large scale yeah. corporate oh. hospitals, that, but the, the reality is that everybody's understaffed, even the yeah. large scale yeah. corporate hospitals. So their, their, their employees are equally overworked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, there definitely are more challenges for a rural single veterinarian practice or one or two veterinarian practice, but um, we, we are burning out at such a rate and people are leaving the field at such a rate that almost no one can really hire the staffing that they need. Mm -hmm. So everyone is overworked, including those big 24 hour practices. Yeah. yeah and I, I, and I was not familiar. I'm not familiar as much with the field. So I did not realize that, but that in regards to larger, um, I just, I always just know the the small veterinary practices and it's like where I grew up. So like, that's my familiarity, but it, and, and we're seeing that even so with across the um, and I went to the dentist and it's so hard to even just get a teeth cleaning. I mean, it's, and then there's turnover and it's, and we're experiencing the great resignation just across all industries because people are just burnt out. But I, I have this feeling that this was a burnout that was coming well before the pandemic. And now people oh. are just cracking. Yeah, um, it definitely was. And I think veterinarians were hit harder than some others with the pandemic yeah. because everybody who stayed home got a pet. And oh so, my like, gosh. Yes. Know, everyone got pets. Yeah. And they, you know, they were home with their pets. So they're seeing things that they may not have seen before. So everybody is going to the vet for everything. And, um, so it, it definitely, you know, took what was a normal stressor and times it by 10. So uh, we definitely have been super heavily impacted. And for whatever reason, you know, it's always been kind of a, a problem that, like you mentioned, human healthcare providers are, are equally overburdened. But for whatever reason, you know, as a society, people are much more forgiving of them having boundaries and only seeing people during certain business hours and saying, no, we can't get you in today. And, you know, with veterinarians, they, they tend to expect that you're going to do anything and everything because you love animals. And, and if, you know, it's kind of a, a, a it's theme. a double standard a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And it's really not fair because, you know, we, we are also humans and we deserve to have quality of life. We deserve to take care of ourselves. We deserve to have families, um, you know, and so it's like, we're doing our best. We're, we, most of us are doing better than our best. Like we're, we're killing ourselves quite literally to provide pet care. And, you know, it's, it's just not sustainable. Yeah. And most likely too, with some of these things, incidents could occur when they find something's wrong. It's like when they're actually, oh, well, 430 comes around meetings done, you know, let's, oh, wait, you know, Bo, Bo, the Yorkshire Terrier is looking kind of lethargic. Who are we going to call? Like, it's, it's also the timing of it too. So it's, yeah. it's, and, and no, I, 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 it's interesting. This is why I love having these conversations. Cause it's just not something that I would have considered. I didn't get a pet in the pandemic, but it's not something that I would have considered it. And I think we need to raise more awareness of it just from an education and, and, and understanding standpoint, because uh, this country loves their pets. So everyone needs to hear this. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, and historically, I, you know, the pandemic has brought out kind of the worst in everyone, you know, it's just like, every, you know, we're stressed, pet owners are stressed. And, um, you know, it, it is something where we kind of just have to put our foot down and be like, this is a problem. And, and yeah. 
establish some boundaries and some set behaviors that we will or won't accept from people. Because yeah, I mean, we're like, we are doing the best we can and that's all we can do. And raising awareness and encouraging, you know, pet owners to, you know, understand the stresses that we're going through and understand that we're doing our best um, is, is something that's super important because it's just, you know, it's got to get better. We can't, we can't make it if it doesn't. Yeah. And as an or- goal oriented type A person, like even doing something that like, doesn't like for us, it fuels us to do those right things and to like, like accomplish, you know, and, and serve in that regard. And it's also hard to create boundaries, but at the same time, like, it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, I struggle with all the time, um, different practice where I'm like, am I not, if I, if I don't, if I'm not giving too much to them, I'm giving enough. Like oh, I had exactly. someone, yeah. Someone told me once, cause I was, I had, when I was had COVID and I was somewhat working, cause I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? Like, I guess watch, this is unproductive, but like, I, I was, I was um, talking to someone and they were like, I was like, yes, yeah, sorry. Like, you know, I've been in and out. They're like, well, your 60% is most people's 100%. So, I mean, I was like, thank you. I will note that, uh, note that, but I guess just to kind of wrap up here on a personal note, is there a lesson from your experience that you hope to get across to others, um, in, or looking to join the veterinary, veterinary, veterinary industry? Sorry. (laughs) Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think my biggest personal lessons, um, were, you know, to expect things to not be easy, obviously, which we, you know, we kind of expect that, but you just don't fully grasp it as a student, what, what that means, you know, that, that that's going to be, a, you, you think once you get through vet school and you graduate and you get your license, it's going to be great. Like Totally. Cause you're like, that was the hardest. Right. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. And, and it's, it's just not the case. Like you're going to have a constant uphill battle and be prepared for that. Um, and I, and then being flexible was a big one for me and trying not to put myself in a box and get stuck where there weren't true boundaries. So, you know, it, I think it's hard. Like I said, when I, when I had to change kind of from a clinical to a non-clinical position, it, you can put yourself in a box and start thinking, Oh no, I can't do that. This is what I've been doing. I don't know how I would do these skills. I don't know how I would learn this. I'm not qualified. It's really easy to get in your head and get stuck and think that you don't have options, but that's just not true. Um, you know, we, we are smart people. We can learn just about anything and we've got a whole lot of scientific background. We, a lot of us have some educational experience if we've done any kind of internship or residency. So it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where learning to be flexible, go with the flow, take opportunities and, um, and be positive about that is, is a big deal. Um, you know, there, there are options. We can do a lot with our degrees, even though it's real easy to think that you can't get stuck. But it's no, really, there's lots of opportunities. I think that's a he- great, great piece of advice. Um, because I even think about, you know, my sister-in-law, she's a, she went to dental school. She's a dentist and kind of thinking about like, if you always want to practice dentistry, or if you want to maybe like turn that into some kind of consulting, there's so much technology being done in the field. Like there are other options, but I think particularly in the medical field, you're just so taught like that set set of skills that you're like, this is what defines me where it's like, actually like, let's think, you know, how can we think outside the box here? And then, you know, use that education to make a different type of impact. So I think that's really, really good advice. Um, and then one last question is first off, how would you define mental fitness? Um, and how do you think that practice can apply to the veterinary mental health conversation? And then how do you personally flex your mental fitness muscle? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I would define it as prioritizing yourself and knowing and setting your boundaries. That's how, that's how I define mental fitness. And I'm not going to pretend like I'm perfect at it. Cause I'm not, I definitely, you know, it's a struggle. I, I like to, I like to help people. I, I like to get things done. So, um, I'm not perfect at it, but one of the ways that I, I do it is I, I do try every day to set up, set down time to, you know, either get outside and take a walk or spend some time with my dogs. Like I've been landscaping a lot recently because there, there are certain things that I wanted. Like I wanted a koi pond. So I decided, Hey, I'm going to build a koi pond, you know? So I try to set time for some of those things that I know are important to me and um, make sure that I hold myself accountable to those things. And then making sure that I have boundaries with, with everyone. And that's, you know, that's not just in my professional life, that's with friends and family as well. You know, I, I have to know what those boundaries are and, 
you know, hold them firm and, and recognize that if somebody, you know, doesn't like my boundary and maybe they get upset, that that's not my fault, that I, I am okay and doing the right thing by setting those boundaries for myself. No, trust me, Katie. I think um, boundaries is my middle name. So I, <laughs> I mean, that I'm working on. I mean, it's Rachel, but boundaries is my second middle name because I think, uh, especially as an empath, and of course, having that attitude type A, trying to, you know, not, and I don't, I hate the word people pleaser, but just in regards to just making sure that everything's just like calm, cool, collected. Mm-hmm. Boundaries are different. Boundaries are pushing this boundaries are uncomfortable because that means that maybe another person on the other end is not happy with that decision. But at the end of the day, I'm sorry, who cares? Like, that's not like yeah. protect yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. The, the, the people who do understand are the people you want in your circle anyways. So, um, exactly. and yeah. I think that was, that was a big learning curve too, was, you know, recognizing that anybody who's having a fit because I didn't do a thing for them that, you know, they expected that I told them, I just couldn't do, those aren't the people I need to keep them in, in my space. You know, they, at least not in my close space yep. that I need to have the people around me who are supportive and understand if I need time to myself or, or whatever. Yeah. No, cool. Well, this has been great. Is there anything else that you want to leave with us before we wrap up our interview today? Um, not really. You know, I think this has been great. I love these conversations. I hope everyone will come see us on Vet Cetera and that we can keep these conversations going in a public place and, and just continue to do our best to, to help each other and get the profession to where it needs to be. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm your host, Jen Sherman of Mental Recess. We have an amazing, amazing guest today. I'm just going to go back to doctor, Dr. Katie uh, Croth, Croth Polly. I, my dyslexia is going in now. Um, she's the director of healthcare education at Etcetera. And then we have Vetcetra. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie. And we will catch you next time. Yeah, no, thank you. This has been great. Thank you for tuning into another episode of We Are Everyone. You can subscribe to We Are Everyone on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and also be sure to visit www.pivotalmoments.org to learn more about the organization. And we also want to hear what mental wellness means to you. So you can follow us on social media, submit your video, and uh, we will catch you next time. Thank you so much.